Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the governor's office announces plans to revamp the state's Medicaid system, and Treasurer Jeff DeWitt's criticism of Governor Ducey earns an attack by a dark money group. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Hank Stevenson of the Arizona Capital Times. The governor's office this week announced proposed changes to access the state's Medicaid system. What exactly is the governor proposing here? Well, it impacts childless adults, about 350,000 people. I think there's 1.7 million on, on access, which is our Medicaid program. And it creates health savings accounts for them. They pay co-pays on, on when they go to the doctor or, or get services and stuff. It's kind of modeled after what some other conservative states are doing. Uh, we'll see what happens. Pretty good reception overall probably at the legislature and among the business community. We'll see what, uh, you know, critics kind of point out that, boy, you're putting a little burden on, on folks that are already kind of, you know, down at the bottom of the economic uh, ladder. It really isn't going to matter what folks think. You know, the legislature mandated the governor do at least some mm -hmm. of this. But it's going to matter what the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid S Services says because they're the ones who say, you know, what's consistent with what Medicaid is supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about helping the poor. Now, tell me how you're helping the poor by saying five-year limits, if you can't find a job, 3% uh, of your or 2% of your income goes into a health savings account. Well, if you can't save 2% in the first place, the state telling you to save 2%, how's that going to help? There's and, some other issues that are going to be and, important. And co-pays as well? How do, the, how do the feds look at co-pays? Co-pays are one of the things that the fed will consider. The, the lifetime limit, they, they've shot that down before. That's more than likely not going to happen. But depending on the way these co-pays are structured, that's something that could actually become uh, you know, part of the program. And it's something that lawmakers have been talking about at the Capitol for a Long time. It's also something that conservative groups, the American Legislative Exchange Council, conservative group that tied to the Koch brothers, um, floats a lot of conservative proposals that are run in states like Texas and Arizona. And the idea is to take people that are, you know, on, on Medicaid, indigent people, and and give them and, and encourage them to to save towards their own, uh, you well, know, health savings. Well, and and it's a health savings account is something conservatives, you know, kind of push for across the board. So this is kind of you know getting the foot in the door at least in one program. Well, but l let's talk about it. You know, I mean, if you've got some somebody who's making $10,000 a year and you're going to tell them you're going to put aside 2% of, of your income in the health savings account, exactly what's that going to pay for? I mean, you know, we're, on well, one hand, idea, it's, it's a lot it's of money. dental and vision care is what it's uh -huh. supposed to be paying yeah, for. And, and do, have you been to the dentist lately? Do you know how much dentists charge? I'm just charge? telling you what the program is designed to I do. I know what it's designed to do, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen that way. And this is very, you know, very similar to the welfare reform type arguments that you've seen in the past, back in the 90s. And you kind of see them popping up now with Obamacare, a number of people going on Medicaid, which is a lot more than you know, the growth is, is pretty high in a lot of states. Um, and, and the number of folks that are out of the workforce. So you see folks kind of on the right kind of pushing for some of these things to at least get people kind of engaged um, and not just being on, on, on social programs. One of the more interesting things that I noticed mm -hmm. in there is the wellness evaluations, which would kind of make you uh, do a handful of different things. It's kind of individualized, but one of the things is stop smoking if you want to be on access, which is, you know, kind of a bold thing for the government to say. I know they've done that down in Pima County for a while. They uh, I don't know if they've reversed that, but they weren't hiring smokers. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing for to be and, in this proposal. And this mimics the, the, the private sector. You've seen a, a number of companies, you know, a few companies starting to do this. Obviously, a lot of companies have wellness programs, and they kind of, you know, dangle a carrot there for, for folks to do this. Well, so well kind that's of the difference between the carrot and kicking someone off, and that's where it's going to get really interesting. If you say, we want you to participate in non-smoking programs, that's one thing. If we say, I'm sorry, you didn't quit smoking, you lose your health care. That's quite some. Well, I think the difference, real quick, well, the difference is these are childless adults. They, 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 right. This is a very you know, tailored thing. So it's not the usual we're throwing the orphans out, you know, on the street type of budget cuts. So, so they've, they've kind of picked a group of people that I think if you talk to people on the street, you, you wouldn't see as much sympathy, you know, for those folks as if you would for folks that are disabled, you, uh, people with children, those type of things. But again, the bottom line is the feds have to say, okay, or this is all just whistling in the dark. The idea of the, uh, the increasing the work requirement. 
limits. How are the federal officials going to look at something like that? Well, I think it depends. I think that there's a handful of things in here that the, the governor and his people really think that th this is possible. The way we've structured this, it's kind of innovative. It's, it goes along the lines of what some other states have done. But there's some other things in here that they have to know just aren't going to be approved. So this package as a whole, you know, it probably won't happen. But bits and piece of it is, pieces of it probably Will. Could it could it be one of those things where some of it is okayed by the feds and others oh. are like don't don't even come in with us? I, I will buy you dinner if the feds approve the whole thing. Right. I mean this is not going to happen. It's very clear some of it's going to be flushed down the toilet. Now the work requirement, as you say, it's not just work requirement. Be looking for work. Be actively engaged. You know if you're already unemployed, you should be registered with Department of Economic Security anyway. You know, what about job training? I mean, how much of that is going to be offered? Because it's one thing to say, look for work, but do you have the skills? And who checks all of this? Is, is, are, are, are people in place already to be well, able to check this to without certain, added personnel? Well, to a certain extent, again, the work requirement is going to be DES. <laughs> uh, in terms of the co-pays and everything else, if you're registered with Access, they've got some of this already built in. Uh, you know, the lifetime limit is just, you know, at some point, oop, you just fell off the end. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jeff DeWitt is the treasurer, the state <laughs> treasurer. We've had him on the program. We've all talked to him regarding his ideas at the governor's plan uh, to help fund education through uh, trust land money uh, is not fiscally responsible. It's not a good way to take care of a trust. How dare he? All of a sudden, uh, Hank, all of a sudden, uh, in Brit Barter's, yeah, swinging. talk to us about this. He, uh, he earned the wrath. He did. There, there's a woman who wrote a, a blog post, essentially, uh, for a right-wing blog um, that just went to town on DeWitt, uh, really boosting Ducey as this conservative hero, the walker of the West, uh, and came to the conclusion that basically uh, there's, there's no other reason DeWitt is doing this than he's thin-skinned or he's turned his back on Republican principles, which, you know, the guy had a pretty good pitch for why he's opposing this. He laid it out pretty clearly. Um, I mean, reading the, the post, it, it became pretty obvious that the woman didn't know what she was talking about for the most part and well, was just kind of spouting off. Well, I think she was doing the, the bidding of her boss, who is a certain Sean Noble, who you may, if you've talked about the uh, the Koch brothers, uh, he's done some work for them. Now, I can't necessarily say that Charles Koch has called up and said, you know, why don't you, you go ahead and, and come down on Jeff DeWitt. But it's very clear that if you tick off the governor and tick off his friends, there is a price to be paid. It happened to a Mesa school superintendent. Mm -hmm. It's happened to other folks. And this gets to the whole issue of dark money and, you know, do we al how much of this do we allow and not know really where the funding's coming from? Oh, we love that term, dark money, right? That always has a clouds over, over top of things. And yeah, it definitely, I mean, it, it does come across as if, if you take on the governor, you, you have some, some price to pay for it. And, you know, that's part of politics now. You see this in other states and other campaigns and stuff. You know, for right now they're playing within the rules. You know, it, it, it's valid to point it out, point out where these people are from. They were writing on Breitbart, which is a you know, pretty popular right-wing site. And, you know, they, her, her employer, DC London, was listed and that's Sean, one of Sean Noble's firms. But it's one thing to say, I don't think it's a good idea or it, uh, he's, he basically said, I don't think the governor's, uh, he didn't never really attack the governor personally. These folks, he, they're saying he prefers to pout because he didn't get the credit. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a thin-skinned Republican. He turned on conservative yes. principles and once elected. And by the way, Scott, well, the Governor Ducey lauded as the Scott Walker of the oh, West. Of I course. mean, you know. And, and, and it be, and, but again, with certain groups, it becomes personal. He's siding with the Democrats. Democrats. Well, first of all, all the Democrats haven't criticized the governor's proposal. They've said, well, maybe there is some merit to taking some of the trust land money. So it's, it's factually inaccurate. But this becomes the kind of Tea Party going for the jugular philosophy that rather than argue the merits of, well, let's see, if, if we take this much from the trust, here's where we'll be, and maybe we could adjust that, and does it, does it reduce the corpus, and how does that affect folks 12 years down the road? That's but just, it's much that's easier to go you know, for, for absolutely. the jugular, to go to, to do personalities. And what's fascinating is the fact that here's Doug Ducey, who you know, made a name for himself by going ahead and coming out ag uh, against a tax increase in 2012, and all of a sudden, now, now that he's governor, here's the next treasurer saying, 
hey, I know how to get some publicity. And Doug just reacting very badly. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's politics these days. It's not just the Tea Party. It's kind of across the board. Is anybody going to read a white paper on, on the state trust land that's outside of people watching the show, maybe, or people down at the Capitol? But they will read stuff, and they will respond, and it's been proven that they'll respond to these kind of negative attack ads. Certainly not healthy, but that's what people respond to. So they will look at something like that. We'll talk about something like that. If she had wrote the, the, a, a white paper on, on Breitbart, we probably wouldn't even noticed it. Well, and real quickly, uh, DeWitt is quick to note that previous treasurers think could agree with him on this, except for obviously for Ducey, but yeah. they agree well, with him. That's the thing, you know, if you believe that your job as treasurer is to protect the corpus of this trust, remember, state was given 10 million acres of federal land when it became the state. The idea being to benefit the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries mainly being the public schools. We're down to about 9.2 million acres. We've sold off some, we're leasing stuff, we're, we're, we're getting money for, for, for gravel. And, you know, it comes down to at what point you dip into that or you should just be living off the interest. Uh, again, we can have a good philosophical discussion, but as Mike pointed out, oh, we'd much rather, yeah. you know, call names. Pouting and thin skin. Okay. And some of uh, the other opponents of this, you know, in the legislature are, are very conservative lawmakers. Uh, Senator Farnsworth, for example, has come out against this. I mean, it's not a Democrat versus Republican right. fight here, at least not yet. Maybe that'll what, be what it turns into in the legislative session. Um, but I really liked, you know, DeWitt came back swinging. He called it, you know, uh, what was it, like uh, amateurish, childish, bizarrely dumb. Um, so, you know, good for him for standing up for like himself. And yeah. <laughs> this isn't the only thing also I, I'll throw out there that, you know, Ducey's office uh, put up a bunch of signs right in front of DeWitt's office this week, uh, you know, talking about how awesome his state trust land uh, plan is. It Just, you know, a, a, a bunch of yes. uh, signs yes. right it's, out it's front of his it's office. It's good to be the governor and control the building. Hmm. Okay. Uh, appeals court rejects uh, Diane Douglas. So she wanted a fast track appeal of her lawsuit. What is her lawsuit? This is, again, this is the Board of Education. Uh, I get to hire, I get to fire, and no yeah, one else seems to believe it. It's a turf war between her and the Board of Education and the governor, and she wanted to get rid of some of the, the evil Common Core people on there, and they wanted to keep them. And there is some gray area on, on who has control and how much control, but the lower court ruled in f against her, um, and the precedent is against her, kind of the history is against her, and she wanted to fast track it, and the appeals court you know doesn't want to do that so they'll go through a much slower process I, she's got a tough one on this one because everything's run that way before we never had this fight before that I can recall and the lower courts ruled in her uh, against her and uh, I, don't, I don't see the judiciary kind of going against her on this well, one. but part of the what she has going in her favor is the way that the trial judge sort of sidestepped the issue Patricia Starr said you know this is a political fight that court shouldn't get involved in I mean she said look there's certainly reason to believe the Board of Education should control its employees but I'm not gonna step in the middle of this mud pie here so now you've got Steve Tully who's a former lawmaker who, who came back with some arguments to the Court of Appeals saying look if you let this continue the elect constitutionally elected school superintendent can't do her job and it's being done by a quote rogue administration yes, meaning Christine Thompson who's the executive director of the board it's a constitutional crisis for an office that has essentially no power <laughs> is anyone supporting I mean big names or any notable supporters of Diane Douglas I mean she's got a few supporters in the legislature who are really going to bat for her at the end of last legislative session but I think a lot of people most people uh, in power just want to see this fight go away mm -hmm. it's been going on for so long and the stakes are relatively low here so it it just seems like a side issue that most people would would just defer to you know Ducey's opinion <laughs> on this all right because it just seems like she's kind of out there swinging and fighting and there's not a whole heck of a lot of folks standing behind her well th what it comes down to is how do you feel about common core that'll tell you where you stand if you want to get rid of common core which is wh what Diane got elected on then you're gonna side with her power to fire the board members who are standing in her way who is Tom O'Halloran and uh, why is he running for Congressional District 1? Tom O'Halloran is a moderate Republican. Now, I know that's a dirty word in the GOP, who was from Sedona, uh, who spent a couple of terms in the legislature, uh, worked very well across the aisle, um, got out and uh, looked around and said, you know, there's a good opening here now that Ann Kirkpatrick is going to Washington, or thinks she's going to Washington as the senator, and I think that rather than fight within my own Republican Party and where everyone is pushing to the right, you know, the Paul Babus uh, of the world, the Ken Bennett's of the world, I'll run as a Democrat, even though I was a registered Republican. And with my name ID, 
I think if I win the primary, and at the moment he could be considered the front runner, he thinks that he can actually make, keep that seat in Democrat well, hands. He was a Republican, then he was an independent when he ran for state Senate. Now he's a Democrat. Is all this uh, flopping around going to hurt him? I don't think so. You know, it, it probably hurts him with the GOP, but what does that matter at this point? Um, I, Democrats have really shown that they're willing to support him. They kept a Democrat out of that race where he was an independent last year for the state Senate, uh, kind of clearing the path for him to be, you know, the, essentially the Democratic nominee or the challenger to the GOP nominee. Uh, he came out and announced this campaign with uh, DJ Quinlan, the former executive director of the party, as his spokesman. Um, you know, high-profile Democrats are really saying, we found our guy, and, you know, he's a former Republican, so what? Can he, can he beat Ken Bennett? Oh, or Gary he, Keeney, he's but got a, likely He's Bennett. got a lot of challenges in that district. He's got a lot of tough questions to answer. How he feels about the Affordable Care Act, which I think he says he supports. How he feels about immigration and amnesty and deferred action. How the national trends are, are going. And I don't know how well the, uh, Hillary Clinton at the top of the ticket will help Democrats in this state. You know, it's a long ways to go. You know, how he's anointed Ann Kirkpatrick over there has taken over, uh, over McCain's seat. But... Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just oh, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think he's got a lot of challenge in that district. But I mean, I mean the, the, not, not, Anne did a good job. She was moderate enough, and she, she got the Navajos out uh, a number of times when she won, and that really helped her. Um, he's got good name ID. He got 48% against Sylvia Allen, I think, in that when he ran as an independent. Mm -hmm. So he's got good name ID up there. It's open for him. You know, we'll see who comes out of the Republican. It could be, you know, it could be Ken Bennett, somebody with some name ID. It could be somebody with lesser name ID, and then you could see the Dems have a real chance there. Yeah, I think a lot will depend on the GOP nominee, um, but but still, he's the best Democrats have, uh, and they're genuinely excited about this candidate because before that, you know, they've they've talked to a few people who have said, "No, I'm not interested." Um, and they really didn't have anyone else willing to run for the seat. I think know. it says something about the Democratic Party that the best person they have is a former Republican. And a former independent <laughs> yeah. and who says, hey, I think I'll try being a Democrat. All right. Um, real ID, we have an extension on the real ID, yes. which means what? We're not going to get uh, accosted at the airport? or Well, not, not until October of 2020. Uh, you know, back after the 9-11 attacks, the Congress told Homeland Security, you know, we want to make sure that the people who are getting on airplanes are, in fact, who they say they are and they've been properly vetted. And Homeland Security has for years been working on this idea of a real ID, a secure identification, where not only the document is physically secure, that it can't be tampered with, but also that you've done the proper background checks and everything else. Well, a couple of years ago, the legislature said, oh my God, we're going to have a national ID card. And they prohibited the state of Arizona from even considering it. Well, all of a sudden, we were facing what would have been a deadline of this spring that if you didn't have a passport, which was the only really other acceptable alternative, you wouldn't be able to get on commercial aircraft. So they passed a bill that said, we're going to allow ADOT to do a real ID uh, and then ask Homeland Security for some more time to, to be allowed to prepare it. And Homeland Security, you know, this past month said, okay, we'll give you the time. You'll have the real ID ready perhaps next April, and then we'll give you until October 2020 to right. get everyone there. And which means if you don't have the real ID, no problem till October 2020. After that, if they decide to enforce it, either get your passport or you know don't take the bus. Flights in, yeah, in November they, they, 2020. November 2020. What do residents need to do to get these new IDs? There well, they need some to have it yeah. set up first. The state has to, you know, make these IDs, and then it's a matter of just going in and, what, 15 bucks or something is well, what yeah, they're saying? But there are going to be some additional documentation. I mean, right now you already need to prove you're a U.S. citizen or here illegally to get an Arizona license. I think that what's going to happen is, for example, they're going to check you through certain federal databases. So that's going to be a, a different change. Uh, they're going to uh, do other kinds of background checks. I don't think there'll be fingerprint or any of that stuff. But uh, the other thing that's going to have to happen is that the folks who are working on this at ADOT are going to have to be screened. We're talking about fingerprinting for them to make sure they're not creating right. fake licenses. So it's not a big additional hurdle. It also means you're going to need to get your picture retaken every six years versus the fact that you can get to be 65 before they say come in again. I think we're one of the last states, maybe Louisiana is sitting out there too. Um, we're the last states. It's, it's always fun when our libertarian Rand Paul type uh, yeah. strain pops up and how he mentions these databases and I think of the NSA and they're running all our numbers and stuff and we don't want that here. And that was state. a weird episode yeah. at the legislature where you had people like Russell Pierce yeah. and Kirsten Cinema teaming up to say no real ID, which yeah. was a, a strange now, dynamic. Just to show you the paranoia of this thing, they had to put a provision in the bill, Bob Worsley, who's the senator, to say 
ADOT can do this, but only if they don't put an RFID chip in this. This is basically a proximity chip because they were concerned right. that you're going to be walking around and all of a sudden the, the, you know, the, the scanners are going to be saying, oh, Howie Fisher's going here. Wait, no, he just went over here. And that had to be part of the law. All right, we've got like one minute left, which is probably just as well. <laughs> Thoughts on the debate last night? Uh, you know, Donald Trump got, got nailed by Fox News on that. Uh, they went after him pretty hard. Um, immigration came up a little bit, but not as much. It was interesting that Jeb Bush, uh, you know, talked about immigration at length, kind of babbling, and he did mention support for, for a legal path there, and, and that could come back and hurt him in the primary. I think Jeb was a loser. He didn't come across looking uh, you know, very presidential. He came across looking very weak. Marco Rubio did very well. He says, I'm young, but that's a good thing. Uh, as far as Donald goes, you know, he's just the comic relief in the thing. I don't think he, you know, I, I, he, he, he'll stay around because he's got his own money, but, you know, he's just comic relief. I, I think the picture to remember was Donald being the only one holding up his hand about, yes. you know, are you willing to go a third party route if you're not the nominee, mm -hmm. which if anything hurt him last night, maybe that was it. And, and real quickly, I know that we, we've already discussed how Governor Ducey is considered the Walker of the West, Scott Walker of mm -hmm. the West by whoever wrote the blog. Uh, where was Scott? He is an invisible man last night. You know, he's he's kind of mellow. He's kind of chill when he talks. He, he doesn't really uh, impact like Trump or Rubio. And, you know, a lot of conservative, the, the, the conservative base, a lot of the thinkers, the Koch brothers like him. Okay. we got to stop it right there. Gentlemen, good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, after hearing this week from critics of the plan, South Mountain Freeway, we'll talk with those who support the project. That's Monday at 530 here on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, physicist Lawrence Krauss joins us for another edition of Science Matters. Wednesday, we'll look at a skateboarder turned photographer. Thursday, check out how Phoenix crime has changed after the Violence Impact Project. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Sinus. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.